from the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Welcome in, everybody. Rory Johnston in the chair on this Thursday night for Open Line. We are so glad you are joining us tonight. Something tells me we're going to get some phone calls tonight uh, mm -hmm. because we have a, a very... Um, somewhat controversial topic, but it's important. It is top of headlines, a very topical uh, political story, and that is trying to understand the timeline of the FBI raid on Mar-a-Lago, and also what's next. What are the implications? I mean, we have a lot of questions, and one of the people we turn to when we have political questions is a regular guest here, and he is joining us now from, I believe, Murfreesboro, and that's Dr. John Vile, a political science professor at MTSU. Dr. Vile, good to see you. Always good to see you, sir. Good to be here. Uh, it's a lot to talk about, yeah. including the weather. <laughs> no doubt about it. So uh, before we even get into the topic, you know one thing that, that I, I tend to, when you are guest here, that I tend to gloss over, we just say, hey, political science professor Dr. Vile, how long have you been at MTSU and what is your role there? I mean, or what type of classes are you leading? I came in 1989. I started out as chair of the political science department, where I was taught for 19 years, uh, much of which during I, during much of which I'd coached mock trial teams. Then I came over to as dean of the University Honors College, and that's okay. where I am now. My primary teaching is reading theses and thesis proposals, and we have a lot of them. Oh yeah, I'll bet, uh, and no doubt some bright uh, young students there. Yes, and just sort of a reminder, you know, anybody who's a senior in high school, mm -hmm. remember your deadlines. I know at MTSU, and it's probably similar other places, if you get everything in by December 1st, if you have, you know, the right ACT score and right grades, mm -hmm. you can qualify automatically for scholarships without special applications. Yeah, so, fantastic. And if you wait till after that, you can end up not getting most of it. Yeah, I have... Two, two kids in college right now, and I've got all those in my phone. I'm constantly reminding them. Um, all right, here's what I'm going to do as we start off. And to our viewers, again, 737-PLUS is the phone number. I'm sure a lot of you have comments about this and questions for Dr. Vile. We'll do our best to get to as many of you as possible because it's one of these touchy political topics. Uh, be patient with us and also, you know, just kind of uh, tone it down a bit and let's try to have a good discussion here. And I'm going to start off, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Vile, yeah. uh, reading uh, my uh, producer, Emila, was uh, gracious enough to give me some uh, reading material here. This is an article, uh, a timeline of, of the effort to retrieve documents uh, from Mar-a-Lago, which is a former president's home in Florida, of course. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Um, this says, uh, I'm going to read a little intro here. Federal officials engaged in a year and a half long effort to retrieve hundreds of sensitive and classified government documents from former President Trump's home, culminating in the FBI search of the sprawling premises August 8th. Then they start with some key dates. And it, it, they go all the way back to 2021, January 18th, and it says crews from a Miami news station spot at least two moving trucks at Mar-a-Lago. The investigators said in court documents contain documents from the White House. Two days later, Mr. Trump makes a rushed and chaotic exit from the White House. And that was Inauguration Day. Uh, Joe Biden sworn in as president. Then they jumped to May 6th, a few months after uh, President Biden took office. This is kind of key. The National Archives and Records Administration begins approaching the former president's team requesting missing presidential records. In the course of the year, the archives and the Trump team had an extensive exchange about the disposition of the records from the former president's White House. And then in late December of 2021, uh, the archives is informed of 12 boxes ready to be retrieved at Mar-a-Lago. And we'll stop there. Do you think that's a pretty accurate assessment of the beginnings uh, of all of this? I believe it is. And one point that you make that I think is really pretty fascinating and seems to be accurate, it, Trump really thought pretty much up to the end that he might be able to stay in the White House. Right. Um, and, you know, interestingly, uh, Jenny Thomas, as you probably know, who is the, the wife of a Supreme Court Justice, Clarence Thomas, 
And uh, uh, we parent? should point out a, a, a very open about being a, a conservative activist, we could say, right? And absolutely. And she apparently testified to the January 6th committee today behind closed doors that she still thinks the election was stolen. Okay. Um, yeah. And, you know, and Trump, I don't know whether he thought it or wanted other people to think that he thought it, but, you know, it. It, recent revelations suggest that it wasn't till pretty close to the date that uh, he decided, yes, he was going to have to leave. Right. Uh, and th I'm glad you brought that up because I have had uh, conservative friends of mine repeatedly ask about um, in conversation. And I love talking to my friends who are liberal, conservative, libertarian in the middle. It's fascinating Thank to hear. You because I'm in the business in the newsroom all day to kind of get out and actually hear what people are, are consuming, their information, and what they're thinking. Um, so we go back to that that point that there are still, uh, there's still a large group of, of people in this country who believe that uh, that election, that there was some wrongdoing, that President Trump won and that it was covered up. And what I tell them as a journalist, 30 years in this business, I will tell them, even though I know there is a distrust of media, but really it's the national level, that there are teams and teams of investigative journalists out there. Of course, we have Phil Williams, but there are print journalists, there are True. local, national. Um, this kind of a story, if you were to break a story like this and come up with proof, I mean, you're going to win every award. You're going to be you're going to be like the next Woodward and Bernstein. I mean, it's it's huge for your career and all of that. And it hasn't happened yet. And there are a lot of investigative reporters who did their digging and due diligence and have come up with a few little things here and there, but still nothing objectively to show that there was widespread uh, election fraud. And I just put that out there, uh, you know, as a journalist. Um, so why do you think that this kind of narrative continues? Well, let's follow up with something else. Okay. There were dozens of court cases in which Trump supporters were given the opportunity to present evidence right. that the election had been rigged or stolen. And there was a time or two where there were one or two cases where they won on a minor issue, but no no evidence right. there at all. And the, the other thing that it might be that fewer people believe the election was stolen than the numbers suggest, because what you find is most independents don't think it was stolen. Most Democrats d don't. Right. About, it varies from like 40 to 60 percent of Republicans have their suspicions. But Republicans as a group are about probably 25, 28 percent of the, of the population. So you get half of that, it, you know, maybe you have 15 or 20 percent of the American people. Now, they, they're very strong ideologically, as yeah. there are on the other side as well. But I, I think I think that water is pretty much under the yeah, bridge. Sure, uh, it's it's a little. By the way, you know, we had something similar in early American history, where in the election of 1824, and I don't remember it personally, <laughs> but in, in 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 that election, uh, you know, there are three people running for president. And the person who got the most votes was Andrew Jackson, but because nobody got a majority, it went to the House of Representatives and John Quincy Adams was elected president. And for four years, Andrew Jackson went around saying there had been a corrupt bargain. He had right. been cheated out of the presidency. Well, he really hadn't. I mean, they, they abided by the, the election, mm -hmm. election procedures of the day, but this resentment actually helped him then win the election sure. in 1828 and again in, in 1832. So uh, let's go then, you know, because it, it is tough when you when you have people who are just stuck on uh, that belief uh, that you're going to sway them. But that being said, you know, is this OK? We mentioned we know that there was a, a rushed exit from the White House, you know, yes. on and on. It's time to go. It wasn't the normal transition, presidential transition. Um, a lot, you know, presidents do need access to certain documents, um, you know, timeline of events, because most of them, first of all, they're, they're going to have a presidential library. Yes. And, and the, with a lot of these documents or copies of them. And the other is presidents like to write a memoir uh, yes. about their time in office. And 
they use it, it is, is it's commonplace for them to be have an agreement with the archives or with the government do you, is it possible that this was just a, a rush a mistake uh, and that you know uh, we're, we're going to find out obviously but that is the <laughs> argument that's being made you know there's been a law since 1978 i believe it was that basically says that documents that are done during a person's presidency belong to the united states so in terms of who owns the documents the united states government owns them right you know how they say in in many crimes and i'm not sure this is a crime but they often say the cover-up is worse than the initial offense and i think we're where Trump could be in some jeopardy is, is first, these are classified documents and some of them are very classified, such that you're not even supposed to see them outside of a designated room. So that's, that's part of it. But the second part is sometime in this, probably a little after your timeline, between December, 21, uh, December of 2001 and the raid on August the 8th, there were representations made by Trump's attorneys that everything had now been turned over. And that did not jive with right. what the National Archivist and others found. And, you know, it, it suggests that either Trump didn't do due diligence in searching through what he actually had to report back, or that he knew it and he just didn't want to give it up. Sure. Uh, we're going to pause there. We've got a number of callers, not surprisingly, uh, on hold. <laughs> callers, be patient. We wanted to kind of lay the groundwork here, and we're going to keep kind of going on and asking questions. But we are going to get to your phone calls, and the phone lines are open if you'd like to call in. We're going to take a quick break. We're back after this.